Good evening and welcome to the Richmond Town Library. My name is Mary Pyrek and I am a supervising librarian. It is nice to see all of you here on a Friday night to celebrate reading and the books that shape us. Since Richmond Town Library opened in 1996, we have been proud to serve as a community hub for classes and programming. Tonight we are honored to open this space up in partnership with the National Book Foundation and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs to bring you notes from the reading life. This is our final event in a series of four conversations featuring neighborhood heroes and literary stars like Alexandra and Alex talking about the books they love most. Hopefully you were able to pick up your copies of New People and Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. These titles will also be featured in August Coffee and Book Program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Beth Harrison, Deputy Director of the National Book Foundation. Please give a big round of applause for Beth and enjoy the evening. Do I turn a thing? Or I could just... Oh, I'm not a rock star, but I want to be one. Okay, is that all right? We're, it's, a, it's an intimate, cozy crowd. I think we can all hear. Um, thank you, Mary. We really appreciate it. We um, are very grateful to the Richmond Town Library um, and everyone who came out tonight on this beautiful night. Uh, as Mary mentioned, it's the grand finale event, Exploring the Life of the Reader. Um, we're honored that Alex Govary and Alexandra Kleeman could be here, and they're going to talk about the ways in which reading informs who they are and how they think. Um, if you came to other events in the series, and I know this gentleman right here came to all of them, superstar, gold star. Um, we had one moderator interviewing one reader, and this is a little bit of a special discussion because we have two native, uh, not native Staten Islanders, but current, a native Staten Islander and, a, and, and presently, uh, <laughs> presently residing in adopted homeland. So that it's a really special night. Um, to give you a sense of the format very quickly, uh, we will have Alex and Alexandra in conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have some time at the end for us to ask questions. Though it is a small group and we can hear each other pretty well, um, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll send a microphone over to you because we're recording tonight because we want this evening to live on online and um, in the archives. So for perpetuity, um, let's use those microphones. Um, after the program, we hope you will stick around. We're gonna have a little reception over in the corner featuring some food from Novelli's, which I understand is kind of a big deal here on Staten Island. So I understand that they do mozzarella three times a day and I just can't wait to dig into that. Um, before we get there, um, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the National Book Foundation. We were uh, uh, founded to celebrate the best in American literature, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. We've produced the National Book Awards since 1950, honoring great books um, by authors such as William Carlos Williams, Ralph Ellison, Rachel Carson, Adrian Rich, Lydia Davis, and ta Coates, to name just a few. We also produce public and educational programs, one of which is called Book Rich Environments, and this summer that program will be distributing 422,000 free books to kids living in uh, public housing authorities across the country, so we're really proud of that. Um, that's us. I want to thank the New York Public Library. I want to thank the Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting this. Um, uh, really, just such a special reading series for us. Um, and now, to the main event. I'd like to introduce Alex and Alexandra to you. Alex Giveri is a Staten Island native, as I mentioned, and the author of the celebrated novels Eastman Was Here and From the Memoirs of a Non-Enemy Combatant. He was selected by the National Book Foundation as a 5 under 35 writer and is a professor of creative writing at Monmouth University in New Jersey. Alexandra Kleeman is the author of the novel You Too Can Have a Body Like Mine and Intimations, a short story collection. The winner of the 2016 Bard Fiction Prize, her work has been published widely in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Harper's, and beyond. A fun fact for the few of you in this crowd who don't know this, these two writers are married to each other. So this is a really special conversation, and thank you so much for being part of it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. We're huge fans of the New York Public Library system. I remember I lived in New York for one summer. I had no access to any university or any library, and I just checked out books and read them all summer long in the heat, in parks. It was amazing. And the National Book Foundation. Yeah. Thank you to the National Book Foundation. Thanks for that introduction. Amazing um, outreach. Yeah, we're huge fans of 
And we're so thankful to you guys for coming out here on your Friday night to the library, which I think is a really fun place, but I know that there are people in the world somewhere probably who don't (laughs) think that. (laughs) So, um, you know, we have a lot in common. We're both named uh, Alex or (laughs) Alexandra and and all these things. Um, But I often think that the thing that we have in common that is most significant is that we are both readers. Um, and I sort of think that reading brought us together in the beginning. Uh, would you agree? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we, uh, we met at a, uh, at a writer's uh, conference, basically a book festival um, called AWP, the Association of Writers and Writing, writing Programs. programs. And um, that was in Boston. And uh, we both, um, excuse me? <laughs> no, it's okay. It's my mother telling you what to do while I'm doing the Q&A. Jeez. Um, but <laughs> We were brought together because um, we both loved Don DeLillo, and he was giving the keynote reading at this um, particular conference. And I sat down, and he sat down right next to me. So um, suddenly, we were strangers enjoying, you know, our favorite writer together. Yeah, um, and that's yeah. a good place to begin conversation from. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But what I didn't really tell him is that I had read his book actually <laughs> before that. I didn't totally make the connection um, because. Uh, you know, you look at the author photo on the back and you never know really who that is and you don't know if you'd recognize them in the crowd. But, um, but I had. I knew that I liked your writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I would wait for the right time to bring it up. <laughs> and I had read her work as well. She had written a story in the Paris Review in probably like 2010 or 2011. And, um, and I remember that story. I really admired it. And um, I remember your... You know, you had a photo up on online, and so I, I think I put two and two together after we we met, and I was like, we both really respected each other's writing. We liked each other's writing, which is important in a couple's relationship, I would say. <laughs> if you ever are looking for a prospective mate and you have the chance to read their writing first, it's a really good way to learn a lot about a person. I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a really long answer to where are you from or, right. uh, yeah. Right. And then we shared, um, we shared, uh, we shared a couple. Uh, we had a couple titles in common that we both really liked. Don DeLillo was one of them. We really loved Don DeLillo's work. In fact, we we picked out a list of our favorite books um, for this event. Don DeLillo wasn't on either of our lists, but I would say he's. One yeah, of our favorite but that's because writers. we were trying to make sure we had different lists, I yeah. think. <laughs> so um, our lists are sort of uh, books that are particular to us, I think. Like, I put books on that wouldn't have been on your list, yeah. and maybe vice versa. Yeah, so. yeah. And um, I guess just the, the way our life works is she's always recommending titles to me. I'm always recommending titles to her. I end up liking her books a lot more than she likes the ones I, I give her, but I it's know. just, it's a give and take, and it's really, it's really wonderful to live with somebody who has great taste in, you know, literature. And also, um, to be able to, you know, there's some books I really want to read, I don't have time yet, like he's reading the whole Karl of Knausgaard series, um, each one is this long, it's like a brick, and I didn't have time to read them, but I would watch him read them, and when he liked, I saw a smile on his face, I'd say, what just happened? Like, just... Just tell me the best parts <laughs> until I have time to put, <laughs> pick it up myself. Um, so maybe we should talk about how um, we became such readers. Um, I love hearing you talk about this. So why don't you begin? How did you? Her her background's very different from mine. Because, I mean, she she came from a, she comes from a family of academics. Books were always around. Yeah, well, we moved a ton. Um, we moved, I think, 11 times before I was 13. And there was only one constant, I think, that every city you move to is going to have a library in it, which is wonderful. And if you go to that library, you can find your favorite book in it, probably. Um, so it's sort of like a familiar network stretched all across the country. And I would check out the library first thing I moved to a new place, you know, and see what was there and try to make myself at home in it. Um, but we traveled a lot, and um, I'm an only child, so you can imagine I spend a lot of time alone, and books are really 
good company, you know. Um, you can carry them around. Whenever you're feeling, you know, bored or uncomfortable in a situation, you can pull a book out and just fall into it. Um, when you're at an adult sort of event <laughs> where no one is speaking your language, you, you can just open up a book and then suddenly you're in a world of your own imagination. So uh, that was really the reason I needed books when I was growing up, I think. How about you? Um, I, um, I wasn't much of a reader like early on. I was more of a TV watcher, <laughs> like movies. Um, but I started to read out of necessity too, just a little later. And I think it was really when I became a teenager. Um, and on the way here, we just passed my high school. And um, I got really uh, deep feelings <laughs> suddenly <laughs> as we drove by there. Because <laughs> high school isn't the greatest experience always. But, I re but it, it jarred my memory a little bit because I remember sophomore year of high school nobody I knew was in my lunch hour. And I was like, you know, what the hell is going on? I'd go into the lunchroom, 100 kids eating lunch, and I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I'm not going to sit at that table alone. I'm going to the library. And so I, I would eat my lunch in 15 minutes and then just spend, I spent sophomore year in the library, just kind of pulling books off the shelf, you know, reading. I remember discovering Kurt Vonnegut at that time. Mm -hmm. Those are the days when I would judge a book by its cover, and I would just pull them off the shelf. I was like, "That's a cool cover. Let me uh, let me take the cover that." Cover does out. tell you something. Not everything, but yeah. something. And in those days, like I could just leave the book basically on the table in that library, and it would be there the next day, you know, for me. And so <laughs> I became a reader that way. I just had I don't know 45 minutes to fill every day, and. Um, and I started to fall in love with reading. But you know, before that, I, I liked going to libraries. My mom would take me to the library really young. And I would love the actual artifacts, the books. I loved going into this, these places and walking out with six or seven books, like a stack of books. I felt like a scholar, you know, like a seven-year-old who had like <laughs> stuff to do now. You, know, you don't have much going on in those days. But, uh, I, uh, you know, and then I put them on my desk, and I wouldn't read them all the time. I just liked having them around, you know. Yeah. And then I'd study Ian Fleming and the whole James Bond world. And um, but I, I liked, I just liked carrying them around. Um, I think I like to be seen with them. They do look cool. <laughs> uh, they look very cool. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, a little kid's. Uh, but also, this is a cool. You know, you don't have anything. You can come here, and you get to leave with free stuff. Well, you yeah. have to bring it back. You have to bring, bring it, back. it back. Yeah, you get to borrow. You get to borrow. Yeah. Um, but something that you said really connects with me because, um, you know, you would go in there uh, during your lunch period in high school when you didn't feel comfortable in other places. And I think a library is always a place where you feel comfortable. It's very welcoming. There's nothing you specifically have to do there. There's no one watching you to see if you're being cool, you know? Um, and uh, when I was done with my days at high school, I remember I would go either alone or I'd go with a friend and I'd walk down to our um, local library, which was really nice was right by a creek and we would just go around and like look at books and we tried to find weird books or books that seemed funny to us and sometimes um i remember one of our favorite books to go and find there was this book of avant-garde plays like when you're a high schooler you're really alert to pretension so we were like oh this book is so ridiculous let's read these things out loud but then i started to go like actually it's kind of interesting like how can they even do this so i go out by myself and pick up that same book and read it without any sarcasm involved. I'd read it really earnestly. And I think that really shaped me because I write some pretty weird stuff nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I liked a book, one of the first books I liked in the library. It's not on my list because I couldn't remember the name, but it was one of those books that basically pulled out all of these famous, uh, you know, famous quotes. And just each page had a quote from a philosopher or a great writer or something. And um, when I was really young, I loved this thing, this book. But for some reason, I didn't take it out of the library. I'd just go to the library and copy the quotes into my <laughs> journal. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, this is an actual book that you're supposed to take with the quotes already written down. But I would copy them as if I was researching something. 
um, eventually. And um, what, uh, why don't we move to, um, I guess, how did you compose your list? What were the, or maybe what are some of the first books that you, that you connected with, either in the library or just? Yeah, I mean, for me, also Kurt Vonnegut. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like those are books that I still love today. And um, they're good books to pick up when you're feeling like a little bit lonely, like you want a human connection because he's got this voice that speaks right to you. You feel like you're with a friend. You feel like you're um, with somebody. It's a companion, you know, mm. um, and it's amazing to be able to write a book like that, I think, to put yourself in there and put your voice in there. Um, so that was a big one for me. And they have great covers. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, what about for you? Uh, well, what sort of unites your list of five books? Um, well, I just have to look at the list that I um, composed. Yeah, these were all books that they are some of my favorites, and um, I think there's a story behind each one. I'm not going to tell the story behind each book on my list, but. Um, the, uh, for instance, Montauk by Max Frisch oh, yeah. was a, was a book we both really loved. That was the first book I gave you when we started going out. Yeah. This is the first thing he ever gave me. He brought a copy of it with him actually. Yeah. Which um, I'll give away by the end of the night. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, um, I had never been given a book by someone I was dating, and so that was just a really good sign to me. Because, um, you know, then even when you're not around them, you're thinking about them. It's a good way to make someone think about you. Like, why did they choose this book for me? Uh, what did they mean by this? <laughs> um, and, you know, really, like, plant a flag in the territory of their mind. <laughs> right. I think it was a good choice because it, it's a love story but it's also a little pretentious. <laughs> it's it's high quality. It's, it's got literary quality. merit. Yeah, it has yeah. literary <laughs> merit. So you probably read it and said, this guy's really smart. This guy's really great, like yeah. <laughs> we, uh, so, but, but we, um, I picked that one because we gave it away at our wedding to everybody who came. Because yeah. it was one of the first books that uh, Tin House reissued it. It was out of print for so many years, yeah. right? And Tin House reissued it same year we were getting married. And so uh, we we gave those away at our wedding. Um, and uh, I guess I'll talk about... How about the book that they have in their hands? Yes. Yeah. So I chose Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, this was one of the first uh, books that I specifically remember taking out of... Uh, you know, a Staten Island, New York public library branch and great kills and um, and just falling into it. And I think this is one of the texts where I fell in love with reading and what a book could could do to you. I was very interested in, um, you know, I was you know, I was a I was a teenager, so I was interested in Eastern religions and, and, and Buddhism and, and I, motorcycles and motorcycles. <laughs> I, I was interested in that, but my, but my mom was like, over my dead body, you're going to get a motorcycle. <laughs> um, but this was the next best thing. Right. Uh, and, um, I thought I would learn something about ma maintaining a, a motorcycle, which you actually do. He talks about, you know, oiling and whatever. I don't know. What, I, I haven't read it in a while. Um, but he also, he also combines all of these, you know, all of this philosophical thought. It's a philosophical text, but I would also call it a novel. It's an autobiographical novel. And um, it was the first book that really moved me um, to tears, actually. Um, oh, really? And you know I don't cry a lot. Yeah, actually, never. Never, never. <laughs> but this, uh, and very rarely can you be moved to tears mm -hmm. with a book. but. You um, you spend, this is a long book. I think when I was a teenager, it took me a year to probably actually finish. But um, it's about a father and son trip uh, through the country on a motorcycle. And uh, the son is really young. I think he's uh, 11 or, you know, 11 or 12. And, um, and you 
you you um, you were with them for so many hours, um, so many days and weeks reading this book, and then um, something happens at the end that that really tore me up uh, between the father and the son, and it happens actually in the um, in the afterword, um, which wasn't included in the original edition. It was in, included in the, when this was uh, became a paperback, um, and uh, it's an afterword by the author. And it just it brought me to tears. It was so sad. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I, you know. I think there's a connection here between maybe I don't think it was. It's a coincidence that in my first novel. I had always planned to have this afterword that would reveal something that really moved, um, mm -hmm. you know, the reader, which is something that I did in my first novel, um, and maybe that was something I picked up from my very first um, read, where I felt like I really became a, a reader. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I hope you guys enjoy this. I haven't read it in a very long time, um, <laughs> but pe people have told me. It's still good. Yeah, it's your one of your favorites too, right, Grace? Um, and I will I will also add that this is another cool thing about books and reading. So I think this book came out in the '70s and it was a huge hit. Um, you know, between like just counterculture, just cool people like my dad, who was a little bit of a hippie <laughs> back then, who rides who rides a motorcycle now, <laughs> and. Um, so I would, uh, I got this book from the library. I would take it on the ferry with me, mm -hmm. and people would talk to me about this book. You know, yes, it's like sending out a signal, around. like a homing right. beacon for people who are like you when you yeah. carry a book around. Yeah, the old edition had this like purple cover. Um, you could really spot it, and um, I remember this one guy talking to me about it, and he he sort of said, I didn't think people still read that, and he he told me. Um, <laughs> He had actually gone on the um, motorcycle trip that uh, is detailed in the book, and we talked the whole ferry ride. It was, I mean, that happened 24 years ago, and I still remember That's that conversation. Amazing. So, Brooks, uh, Books, Brooks, that was his name. Um, no, Books <laughs> just, you know, brings people together in my life. How about you? Well, that's a fantastic story behind that book. And I think I chose my list of five most recommended books based on um, something different, which is that these are the books I travel with. Like when I'm going on a long trip or I'm going on a residency and I have some writing I'm going to have to do, um, I, every one of these books is sort of dense and mysterious and a little bit challenging so that even though I've read it each one many times over, I always feel like there's something else to read in it. Or I can pause and I can read it like sentence by sentence and just spend a long time reading one page and uh, s still feel like I really got something out of that. So like, um, I guess they're books that I reread. They're books that are still sort of um, difficult to wrap my mind around even now. Um, and I recommend them to people for that same reason. It's like, uh, the same reason you want um, a hard candy sometimes, like it really lasts and, and the satisfaction and the experience lasts a long time. It never sort of tires out. I guess right. it's an everlasting gobstopper. They're all everlasting gobstoppers. <laughs> right. And are the books that we were talking about in the uh, programs uh, there? Okay, yeah. Because you have... Yoko Tawada, The Emissary, mm -hmm. uh, Taking Care, a uh, story collection by Joy Williams, New People by Danzy Senna, which everybody has, yeah. and Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said, interesting choice. Yeah, that's Philip my K. Dick. favorite Philip K. Dick. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and Dicte. Yeah, which is a very strange, abstract, sort of halfway between a poem and halfway between a novel or a history book. Um, it's kind of all books in one. It's the ultimate book to me. <laughs> um, it, it even has like characters, um, Chinese calligraphy, Korean characters, photographs in there. It's, it's everything. Um, but I chose Danzi Senna for that list because um, I think sort of the foundation of my desire to read was reading mysteries when I was younger. Um, I feel like every book actually does have a mystery in it that you're trying to figure out, um, and some of them have it more explicitly than others. Um, I know one really important time in my life, uh, 
my parents went to Japan for a summer and they took me with them. They were doing some research and they told me you can only bring two books. And I was like, how am I going to choose two books? <laughs> you know, this is, um, we're going to be there three months. But um, I had to make do. Uh, I chose an Agatha Christie novel. And I chose The Phantom Tollbooth. Um, and I read the Agatha Christie novel over and over again. And I remember playing games um, with the book, like going, OK, so we know how it is supposed to end. But what if there are clues that actually something else happened? Like a, a different person was the killer. Can we find them? Like, And I would imagine other ways in which the same setup could turn out. So there were a lot of potential books contained within that one book um, <laughs> when you're really forced to use your imagination in that way. Um, and so when I read uh, New People by Danzy Senna, this book is very literary and it's also about a narrator who's figuring out um, she's biracial and she's figuring out where she fits in the world. Um, but I think at its core, it's sort of a suspense novel because this person is about to get married to another person who looks a lot like her, acts a lot like her, but she feels drawn to other worlds. So um, you're figuring out her identity as she's figuring out her own. And it's sort of like a strange literary take on that same mystery structure, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's sort of a beach read, but I'm not sure if you will find it to be a beach read. <laughs> it's more of a beach read than Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I'll tell you that. Um, but you, that's so interesting how you say you think every book contains a mystery, because I, I agree. And I was just thinking of uh, Motorcycle Maintenance, and there is a mystery in there uh, where the book gets really interesting. There's this character who he keeps talking about and you don't quite know who this character is, but it turns out it, it'll become very clear. I'm not ruining it, but um, it's himself, uh, an earlier oh. version of, of himself. And he mm -hmm. had a kind of like a nervous breakdown. And so he refers to himself uh, by, you know, a different character name, the earlier version of him. And it's kind of, you put that mystery, um, you know, together, but there are other mysteries in it too. And, yeah. and you find this in every... Um, I mean, almost every, yeah. every book. I mean, that's a fun game you can play with any book. What is the central mystery of this book? <laughs> right, right. Maybe a class that we could teach eventually. Yeah, Maybe someday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then what was the, the, you brought the Phantom Tollbooth to? Uh, yeah. See, this is, this is a really terrible thing to do this woman because she's a very, very <laughs> fast reader. She reads a book in like a day and she's done with it. And, um, you could only bring two books, so I can imagine you were finished in the first week with both of them, and you had, I don't know, yeah. 10 more months to go. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard. It was a difficult time in my life, um, <laughs> for sure. But um, actually, I think that we read a little bit differently, because you read a little slower than me, but you remember a lot more, um, which is useful when I forget. <laughs> um, Thank you. I just read. Yeah. But we talked about how we became readers, but I'm wondering, now that you consider yourself a reader, how do you decide what to read? How do you choose a book off the shelf or find a new book? What are your strategies? Uh, yeah, that's tough. I think, I mean, we're all on our own, like, as a reader, we're all on our own path, uh, whatever that is, a, just a subject, several subjects it's that very zen be you can, yeah i know i've been reading zen you know all day so but i just feel like we are all our own, on our own path and then titles pop out at you and um they um they become clear but you still have to be you still have to actively you know look for them um i'm not sure i mean we read book reviews religiously uh, every weekend. Every weekend, the New York Times book review and book blogs. We're always looking. I'm always looking through Facebook and, you know, getting irritated like, oh, he's got another book coming out, or, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but we're always on the lookout for for great books. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm thinking you know, we get pretty busy and we don't have as much time to do this, but I really love um, when you sort of make a new friend, getting 
a recommendation from them, one of their favorites. And then as you read it, you really like learn a lot about that person. And the next time you see them, you have something to talk about with them. It's like yeah. a gift of time. You give your own time to this friendship by doing that. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm always recommending books to other people. They're always recommending books to me. We like using uh, the local bookstores. Um, uh, sometimes the libraries have, uh, you know, the, sort of their new section, which they put up. The Stapleton Library by us, they have this sort of like Vietnam section, which was very helpful when I was writing my, my last book. Um, so I always gaze at whatever is new and whatever that particular store is, is recommending. I know you do that a lot, and you have a couple bookstores that you love their taste uh, yeah, for what they display. I know out someone there. who works there, and they'll tell me what's just come in that they really right, like. Right. Yeah. But um, I also love the way the library works as a way of finding new books. Um, sometimes uh, I'll have a topic I'm interested in, right? And I have a book that matches that topic. But I won't go straight to that book. I'll look all around it because everything near it is its neighbor and is sort of related to it in some way. And so you find things that you would never have found in a search or maybe never heard about otherwise. Um, and it's just because the library does such an amazing job collecting these books in space and presenting them to you in a way that's so accessible and actually like fun to wander around. Yeah, um, that's a great, that's a great uh, <laughs> tactic that I've never. Uh I've never done that. I one of the books on well, we talked about Montauk and Max Frisch, but I remember I discovered that writer, uh, who is um, an Austrian writer, who uh, is dead now, um, much more popular in the the '60s. But I discovered him because I was in college, and I remember my teacher uh, mentioning his um, title called I'm Not Stiller, and I just love that title, I'm Not Stiller. I just couldn't get it out of my head. It's a great title. And I always wanted to find that book, and it was out of print, and this was, this was kind of before Amazon, or Amazon was out there, but I didn't have a credit card or something, so I was always just, you know, it was, it was fun to look through used bookstores and piles of books, and eventually I found I'm Not I'm not Stiller. So titles are really important. I, sometimes I'll read a book just because I love the, I love the title. I have, to, I have to pick it up. Yeah, just looking over there on the shelf, um, we didn't read this book, but you have this book, The Italian Teacher. We agreed yeah, that was right. a great title. Yeah, it's a good title. <laughs> we Italian talked about teacher. it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tom um, Rockman. The, I think like we're getting a little bit close to the end. So I wanted to ask you a question that I know lots of people ask me. So it might be on people's minds. Um, but what is it like to be married to another writer? Do we read each other's work? Is it fun <laughs> or is it terrible? <laughs> no, for us it's fun. People really ask me this a lot. Yeah, yeah I always tell them it's fun. Um, you just read a, a short story that I finished um, I yeah. sent it to you. She's writing a new novel, and she sends me chapters as soon as they're done. It's like yeah, it's he's great. reading it in the style of a Dickensian old novel in installments. As soon as it's <laughs> as really as cool. I print them yeah, out. I get um, you know, uh, you know, every couple of weeks I get a new chapter. I can't wait for the for the next one. But we do like sharing our work. We don't share everything because you write a lot of other stuff, nonfiction essays. Book yeah. reviews, and I'll read like so, his book review when it comes out in the paper. But I, right. um, he doesn't need to share it with me right when he's yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and you just write too much stuff to I can't read all of it, or I, I would never get to it. But um, yeah. But do you think that um, we are better readers of each other's work because we know each other so well, or do you think maybe we're not quite as good at reading fresh? Oh. Um, I think we'll, time will have to tell. We'll probably get used to each other, each other's stuff, and maybe not be able to see whether it's oh, yeah. bad or not. I don't know. Yeah. But um, I do think, like, um, when you bring your work into a writing workshop or when a critic reads it, um, they give you one kind of take. 
but they don't always know where you're coming from. And to have someone see you, right, and see where you're struggling and be able to tell you, like, you need to push on or you need to have a snack. Like, you need to, like, drink a glass of water, <laughs> have a snack, and <laughs> not worry too much <laughs> yeah. is really helpful. It is a joy, though, to see how a writer works. Uh, we experience a lot of the same things when we, you know, go out to dinner, go on vacation. And we'll, I'll sometimes see moments that pop up in her, her fiction. Um, you know, um, there's one particular story um, about the, the couple, they go on vacation. And it was right after we came back from Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, it, it was, was like so the place funny. that we had gone to. It was like a satire of me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> me and my thoughts on breakfast and meals because <laughs> we were like we had all these free meals and I was like we got to eat lunch it's free yeah. we got to get there and she's like I'm not even hungry yeah <laughs> <laughs> or um like conversely my dad has a vanity plate and, and like it, oh, yeah. it's kind of a cool vanity plate it says Dallas but maybe it's also silly um but I was reading his most recent short story and I saw the character has a license plate that says Dallas yeah, I I'm like, what are you trying to say about my dad <laughs> what does that mean so whatever detail you can use to make it real you know it is a good detail it's a good yeah. detail uh, you, he'll be happy about it. So he'll be proud of me. with that in mind, um, I want to open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Um, <laughs> reading, writing, us specifically, you specifically. <sighs> oh, yeah. Okay, right there. Uh, <clears throat> this has been delightful. Uh, I have a few questions, if that's okay. Did you read all of Alex's books, and did you read all of Alex's books? Yes, and fortunately, we met each other when he had um, one book out, and then he wrote another novel, and I had zero books out. I'm, now I'm not he... talking about the books you've written. I'm talking about the books. Oh, the books oh. we recommended. Oh, those books. Um, no, we haven't read all of these uh, yet. Um, Do you plan to? I plan to now, okay. yeah. yeah. You know, it's rare <laughs> that you get to sit down and make a list like this. Um, it's Some, fun people, to do. It's, it was fun, yeah. People ask me all the time, um, like, what's your favorite book? And I have a very hard time answering. The other um, thing is, uh, do you ever read nonfiction? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. magazines and newspapers? Because, you know, yeah. the reading life, it's called the reading life. It's not the reading life of novels. Right, right, right. So yeah. I, f I, find, we, I find that the, the library is, um, for a person who likes to read, uh, the different branches are enabling in an addictive way. You know, you can take out so many books from the New York Public Library. Brooklyn is even more, and you can renew them and renew them and renew them. And that thing about having the books around but not reading them, but just renewing them, renewing, you know. <laughs> but in terms of, of, of the uh, maintenance of a motorcycle, I read a lot of technical books. Yeah. And when I was in college, I was in architectural school. There was a lot of work, but I always had to stop what I was doing and take out some kind of light novel to sort of like, you know, it's like having a uh, grapefruit sherbet as a cleansing for 11 you know. Right. You need a palate cleanser. <laughs> yes. That's yes. what I use nonfiction for, okay. I think. Yeah. I, I, I just, I'm reading this great book now on Texas um, by Lawrence Wright. It's called uh, uh, God Save Texas. Great book, great book on Texas. But when I get, I get fictioned out, like I can't read any more fiction and I need some facts. Yeah, and we read <laughs> you know? a lot for research for the fiction too. Like I'm reading about um, California and the early settling of California and drought in California. Yeah. But we also, we, we fight over the new New Yorker when it shows up because <laughs> there's something in it that we both really want to read and um, you can only, only one person can have it at a time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and sir, because you asked the first question, you get a free copy of Montauk. There you go. Second question. Hi. Um, I am always interested in the kind of nuts and bolts and mechanics of reading, like, are you uh, at a desk person, on the couch person? Ebooks, no ebooks, audiobooks, no like 
you know, or you just like got to have the hardcover? What's your kind of what are what are the tools in the in the you know? She's the very um, particular about this. Am I? Well, <laughs> you um, you the way you treat your books, it's amazing. Like you really take care of them. Oh, you mean like not dog earing them or turning right. them all the way around so that they have right. a crease down the back? <laughs> yeah, I I like to the paperback. I like to bend the front cover around. Sort of like this. I don't think that should have a spine breaker. And then uh, <laughs> she freaks out. She's like, "That's my copy." Um, what are your? Uh, you don't like ebooks? Um, I don't really like to read ebooks because I think I read them a lot faster because I'm um, uh, my fingers ready to flip to the next page before I'm all the way at the bottom of the page. So it just lets me read faster than I normally would. Um, but I really like to read um, on my commute, especially since uh, we moved to Staten Island about four years ago. So I take the ferry, and when you're on the ferry, you don't have to worry you're missing your stop. So it's just 25 minutes where you can be reading all the way through. It's wonderful. Um, and uh, so I read a lot when I'm on the move, and I always bring one fiction book, one nonfiction book, and then one other thing in case neither of those are right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like, um, I like, I always like the book better, but when I want a title really quickly, you know, you can get the ebook now, like at night, as soon as you think of it. So I'll, I do the chapter previews. I love those on the, the ebook. And um, I do all my reading in bed. At, yeah, before going night. to sleep. That's yeah. like the quietest part of the day. Right. Yeah, it's like meditation for me, it puts me to sleep really easily. It's, <laughs> Um, thank you. Any other uh, questions? Oh, we have one over here. What are you reading right now? Each of you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm reading this really amazing book that's going to come out in August called The Third Hotel by Laura Vandenberg. And it's another one um, that feels like a thriller to me. Like um, the characters in it read Patricia Highsmith novels and it feels like a Patricia Highsmith novel. Like um, you don't know if people are exactly who they say they are. There's this tension, suspense. Uh, I, get to a lot of, I go to a lot of book fairs and stuff and I get to a lot of the galleys. So I have a city there. Yes. <laughs> I recommend it, yeah. It's good, yeah. <laughs> but it's about a woman who, um, whose husband has recently passed away, and she goes on a trip that they were going to take together to Cuba, and then she thinks she sees him there. So I, has she really or not? I don't know because I'm not done with the book yet. I'm literally reading it right now. <laughs> I'm reading um, this book, Motherhood, by Sheila Hetty, which just came out maybe this summer? Yeah, like a, maybe a month ago? Yeah, and it's about this uh, woman, uh, Sheila Hetty. Uh, it's not quite a memoir. I would call it a it's novel. It's sort of a novel, but it seems like it's based on her life. Yeah, autobiographical novel. And um, it's about the decision to um, have kids or not at um, you know that certain age. Uh, she's approaching uh, 40. Um, it's really... It's really fantastic, um, and uh, yeah, she's and someone like we talk about um, how it doesn't mean that much to say someone's a good writer, but she really is this charming writer. Her voice like is interesting to listen to. She sounds like a person you'd like to know, um, and even though she's talking about things that could be maybe boring if someone else mentioned them like she has a way of making them seem really interesting yeah and it's a very candid intimate uh read too you're you're, you're almost like i can't believe you're telling telling us these things <laughs> <laughs> about your you know your partner and your um it's 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 great so far well one more question It's really not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> and the comment is that it's so delightful to listen to two people that are so in sync with each other, and now you're married. <laughs> this is beyond a book. <laughs> uh, thank and you. just absolutely beautiful. Oh, many, many you. happy years. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.
is a, whoa, is this still on? That was a beautiful comment and a beautiful series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Alex. And please join us for a little reception. We can have some more book chat and life chat. And um, thanks to the, to the Richmond Town Public Library. Thanks for coming, guys.